Syracuse has won its last three games, and that's called a win streak. It's happened before, just not this year until now. To be the best, you gotta beat the best. The problem is, the Syracuse women's lacrosse team is looking for its first win over a number one ranked team since 2014. Now sometimes, the hype is justified. Think the dream team, LeBron James entering the NBA, or Spider-Man No Way Home, things like that. Arguably, there has been nothing more hyped than tonight's Duke-UNC game. You probably haven't heard this before, but this is the first time they're playing in the NCAA tournament. The top five teams in the North Division make the Calder Cup playoffs. Coming into tonight, the Syracuse Crunch sit in fourth place, so it's safe to say it's crunch time. But I know if you're anything like me, you're dying to get back to foosball with your friends. Well, today, the orange and blue spring game gave us a much needed tease. Uh, coming home, it's nice for all of us. I know it's my favorite part of the day, but there's something different about coming home to become head coach of the program you start at back in the day. There may be traditions like no other, but for many people, there's no better place to be in April than at the ballpark on opening day. So on the one hand, women's basketball favorite legend comes home to lead the team in a rebuild. On the other, the patriarch of the women's hockey team goes out and says goodbye. Well, you've heard the saying, almost only counts in two things, and one of them has not been Syracuse basketball this year. It's no coincidence that the Mighty Pucks spotlighted on not just the athletes' competitiveness, but also their sportsmanship and friendship that represents the Special Olympics as a whole. That's because that's the goal they're shooting for. The new rules mean big changes not only for the SU athletes who play here at the Carrier Dome, but also for the merchandisers like Manny's here on Marshall Street. So Congratulations. Thank you. Nice job. That's what the Olympics are usually all about. <laughs> Getting the gold medal. But at the Special Olympics, it's much more than that. Ten-year athlete Matt Graham says he still always goes for the gold, but it's okay if he doesn't get it. It's all right. It's all right. As long as you shoot for the stars, you can always land in the clouds. If I miss a gold and I get a silver or bronze, I'm just as happy. Graham is a captain for the Mighty Pucks floor hockey team from Albany. The Pucks stand out, not just for the hot pink jerseys the players picked out, but for the way they play. Good game. Good game. First year coach Courtney Sim tells this team to be the same way on the floor as they are off of it. That's what they're about, is helping each other, and that makes me more happy than any win on a board. It's also not just sportsmanship they're all about, but friendship too. The Pucks have been practicing together twice a week since November for over an hour each time. Sim says they're all friends and spend time together outside of practicing for the Olympics. There we go. Yes, we get competitive and yes, we uh, get disappointed at times, but we always support each other. It's no coincidence that the Mighty Pucks spotlight on not just the athletes' competitiveness, but also their sportsmanship and friendship that represents the Special Olympics as a whole. That's because that's the goal they're shooting for. What it really is, is showing the world inclusion through sports. As the Special Olympics CEO, Stacy Hengsterman says, don't be fooled. These athletes are competitive and want to win. Get it, get it, get it. But you find much more than that in them. You find incredible sportsmanship. Even if they're going against somebody, they will shake hands at the end. Even if they don't win, they are gracious um, in everything that they do. Sim and Hangsterman both said their favorite thing about the entire Special Olympics is the athletes. They're inspiring to say the very least. Dylan Johnson. Thank you, Syracuse! NCC Sports. So sometimes uh, you got to have, have some tough skin to uh, stick into it. Danny Abreu has been a high school official for six years working basketball and lacrosse. This year... He's facing double the work he used to. That's because of a shortage of officials. It's something that's been going on for years, but has become worse since the COVID-19 pandemic. I like it, I like it, but for some officials, it, it's a problem. Part of the problem is officials being busier than ever at work. Abreu worked for seven or eight days in a row as an official on top of his full-time job as a salesman. Abreu says the money helps, but he does it more to get involved in the community and give back to kids. A larger part of the issue, however, is the way officials are treated. And, and it's come to a point 
in some cases that people just turn it away, they don't want to work anymore. And it's not just the two sports that Abreu officiates that's facing a shortage of officials, it's every sport. For years, and the New York State Public High School Athletic Association is trying to do something about it to keep the games being played. We need officials. We need them in all sports. It's not just a, a male issue in the sport of football or female in the sport of volleyball. It's officials across the board. Communications Director Chris Watson says this has been an issue all five years he's worked there. Watson says their main pitch to recruit officials is with the extra money they can earn and the chance to give back to a sport they love. But a bigger part of keeping officials coming back is how they're treated during games. In taking care of them and making sure that they're in a, a work environment that they want to be in. I think it starts with all of us and it starts with spectators, fans, moms and dads. You know, how we treat officials is indicated, you know, whether they come back or not. My dad always wanted me to be a basketball player, but I always wanted to be an apple farmer. It's common to look around Syracuse and see star basketball player Buddy Bayheim on Cameo, at Apex and Destiny USA, or even on a box of Three Wishes cereal. Buddy, let's fly again! But that's something that wasn't possible until less than a year ago when the NCAA approved policies for name, image, and likeness. Buddy Bayheim working hard. That means that an athlete could run a camp. That means that an athlete could monetize um, selling merchandise. That means now that an athlete could also monetize corporate sponsorship um, within certain restrictions. That began last summer after multiple states Why? passed legislation Don't protecting athletes from being punished for earning me? money from endorsements. Shooters gotta shoot. Oh. The NCAA opposed the change. So the argument against it was, well, we're already giving these athletes all this money to go to school. Yes, but no. Dave Maloney teaches one of the country's only NIL courses at Syracuse University. He says that each team at a school doesn't get enough scholarships for all its players. For example, college baseball, which Maloney played, gets 11.7 .7 scholarships for a team with way more than 11 players. And before NIL, the NCAA profited while the players did not. Kevin Durant, right? He'll always make the comment as I walk into the bookstore at Texas and there's the 35 jersey and I didn't get a dollar from that, but the university's making money. The new rules mean big changes not only for the SU athletes who play here at the Carrier Dome, but also for the merchandisers like Manny's here on Marshall Street. So we always would do t-shirts with their numbers on them and, and we would do some jerseys, uh, but the people are always like, whoa, why can't you put the name on it? And the, a lot of people didn't understand that there were rules in place preventing that. So there's always been a demand for it. Mike Feast is the general manager at Manny's on Marshall Street near campus, and he says that the past year has been like the Wild West, getting in touch with SU athletes to negotiate merchandise. There was players that we wanted to reach out to, but it's like, how do I get in touch with you? I don't know. You know, I send, send them a message on Instagram, and they don't know me from, from Adam, and they're like, who's this guy? You know? To save on time and confusion, earlier this month, SU partnered with the Brandar Group to handle NIL negotiations, one of the first such collegiate deals. The university says fans can expect official SU merchandise with players' names and numbers soon. I'm Dylan Johnson, and NCC News knows, and now, so do you. Donnie, baseball night. Don Mattingly may be better known, but he isn't the only Donnie Baseball to be remembered. Syracuse Donald Donnie Baseball Johnson was nothing less than a press box legend. Johnston passed away on January 3rd at 61 years old. Donnie was known for his kindness, above and beyond hospitality, and a remarkable ability to calculate stats in his head. We all miss your love of numbers. We miss your love of the game. We miss, I think, your love of people. Most of all, Johnston spent over two decades as press box attendant for the Mets and formerly Chiefs. Donnie also held similar positions with Syracuse Crunch Hockey, Silver Knights Soccer, and Central Square High School Athletics. In these non-baseball contexts, he was often referred to as Donnie Stats, but the care and consideration he put into his work was always a constant. Somebody who loved to serve others, more of that and Syracuse honored its longtime press box attendant in the most fitting way you could think of by naming 
that press box right there after Donnie. Going forward, visitors to his ballpark will be greeted by signs saying Donald Donnie Baseball Johnston Press Box. It's fitting for a man who persevered through childhood trauma and subsequent health issues on route to becoming a beloved figure throughout the Syracuse sports community. If anybody came to the stadium, he made sure that you were comfortable and made sure you had everything you need. Even if you said no, he would make sure you had it anyway. <laughs> Donnie Baseball has only been gone for three months and 26 days. But at NBT Bank Stadium, the Syracuse sports community and beyond, he will never be forgotten. Anything sports related, especially in the Syracuse area, I don't think anybody can think about it without my dad, Donnie Baseball. <laughs> Dylan Johnson, NCC Sports. To be the best, you gotta beat the best. The problem is, the Syracuse women's lacrosse team is looking for its first win over a number one ranked team since 2014. It's senior day in Q's hosting number one ranked North Carolina this afternoon. No Emma Tyrell for the Orange, she's out for the rest of the season, but Megan Carney though, back in the lineup after missing two games. You don't have Emma, but you do have Megan Tyrell. She scored three goals in the first. The SU and UNC tied, after four, tied at four after one. In the second, Megan Carney, her 26th goal of the season. That was it for her, though. She wouldn't play in the second half. A minute until the break, Natalie Smith scores. She had a hat trick on the day. Tied at seven at the half. UNC would build a three-goal lead, but here comes the orange. Sam Swart pulls Syracuse to within one. Eight minutes left now, and my, Megan Tyrell can just not be stopped. She tallies her 50th goal of the season right there. Six points on the day for her. SU would get to within one, but UNC's Jamie Ortega scores her fifth of the game, sealing it for the Tar Heels. Syracuse drops a heartbreaker, falling to top-ranked UNC 14-12. There's just over three weeks left in the AHL regular season. The top five teams in the North Division make the Calder Cup playoffs. Coming into tonight, the Syracuse Crunch sit in fourth place, so it's safe to say it's crunch time. Syracuse is back in the friendly confines of Upstate Medical Arena after four straight road games hosting Springfield. Down two in the third, Anthony Richard forces the turnover. Riley Nash puts it in, his fourth goal of the season to pull the crunch within one. Richard wasn't done though. Under eight minutes to play. Richard snaps one past Joel Hoffer to tie the game at three. It's not only crunch time, it's the crunches time. Gage Gonzalez scores the game winner, and Syracuse rallies for a 5-3 win, moving the Crunch into third place. Hey, father time may be undefeated, but Mother Nature isn't doing too bad either. She's getting in the way of today's game, raining out the Syracuse Mets and the scranton wilkes Bear Rail Riders. Today's game will be made up as part of a doubleheader on Wednesday, January 8th, June 8th. Syracuse is 1-4 so far and hits the road to face the Columbus Clippers on Tuesday. On to some baseball that did get played today. The New York Mets still on pace to go 162-0. Scoreless in the top of the fifth, but not anymore. Pete Alonzo clears the deck with a grand slam. He's hit over 100 homers in his first three seasons, but that's big fella's first career slam. Deserving of a bat flip, I say. On the mound and with a big lead now, Chris Bassett hounding Nats hitters in his Mets debut. Eight strikeouts in six scoreless innings, following up Trevor McGill's scoreless outing in the season opener. The New York Mets blank the Nats 5-0 and start the season with three straight wins. They go for the sweep tomorrow, first pitch at 1.30. We take the subway over to the Bronx. The Yankees looking for three straight against the Red Sox. Feeling good, but not for long. Top of the six we go, tied at three, and Bobby Dahlbeck goes yard the other way. He gives the Red Sox the lead, and in return, a cart ride in the dugout. This one's far from over, though. Sox reliever Jake Diekman on for the ninth, facing the Yankees' boppers. First up, Aaron Judge. Yeah, you may be seated. That's one down. Next up, Giancarlo Stanton. And see ya. Yankees down to their last out. Last but not least, Joey Gallo. And forget about it. The Red Sox avoid the sweep, winning 4-3. For three days, all the headlines and crowds at the Masters have revolved around Tiger Woods' comeback to the sport. After all, he doesn't just move the needle, he is the needle. But as we entered the final round today and Tiger faded from contention, you realize somebody will actually win the Masters today. And the guy leading the pack is only the number one ranked golfer who's on fire right now. Scotty Scheffler entered today leading by three strokes but clinging to a one-stroke lead after Cameron Smith's two birdies. On number three, Scheffler meets the challenge and chips in for birdie. 
Smith bogeyed that hole, so the lead was back to three. Speaking of Smith now, over on number 12, trying to come back, and uh-oh, he doesn't look happy about that shot, and that's why. That one takes a swim, and Smith isn't able to get back into contention the rest of the way. Taking his place chasing Scheffler is Roy McElroy, setting a final round record with a 64 today. And wait a minute, surely that shot isn't going to go in, is it? Oh man, Rory gets the crowd on its feet with a beautiful birdie on the last hole. Record day for Rory, but doesn't get the win. Scheffler gets the win by three strokes. It's his first major and fourth win in the last six tournaments. The only other golfer to do that is, you guessed it, Tiger Woods. Scheffler collects the green jacket. That does it for sports tonight. Now for one more look at the weather forecast after the break.